What I'd like to talk about, actually, right now, is health. Health. And more specifically, what we can do to keep it, and what we can do if we're lucky enough to have it, and what we can do to restore it uh, if our health is compromised. But what are some of the factors that can influence health? If we want to make sure that we remain healthy, what are some of the things that can Well, there are what I call the usual suspects. We can try to keep our weight down. We can make sure that we eat the right foods, nutritious foods that are not high in calories. We can make sure that we get lots of rest, relax, <coughs> and learn stress management techniques. We can make sure that we get lots of physical exercise. Um, and a lot of people would argue nutritional supplements uh, can be very helpful. But although those are all uh, very valid and very important factors or important measures that you can take to ensure health, um, there's another factor that is seldom recognized uh, as being as powerful as it is, yet it, I believe I would like to argue, and I'm going to provide some evidence for uh, uh, into my lecture, that it may be more powerful than, in, than any of these other factors. And so what is that factor? It is what I call the S factor. Now, if any of you have, have checked the, the slides uh, already, you probably know what it is, so it's not going to be a big uh, um, thing. But um, Now, let's take a look at diabetes. Diabetes is a huge problem. In 2008, 6.3%, which is like 18 million people in the U.S. alone, uh, had diabetes. The prevalence tripled from 1980 to uh, 2008. It tripled from 5.6 million to 18 million. And it's the sixth leading cause of death. Okay, so. I went to the CDC's website, Center for Disease Control website, to find out, well, you know, if you wanted to avoid, other than genetics, you know, if you wanted to avoid getting diabetes, what can we, what can you do? Okay, so what are some of the, the risk factors? Well, poor eating habits, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, stress, and the usual suspects. But this S factor was conspicuous by its absence. Um, <clears throat> I checked two books that are used by uh, diabetes clinicians to inform their practice, the clinical practice. These are uh, books, so one of them is put out by the American Diabetes Association, and the other one is uh, by Jocelyn's Clinic in Boston. It's a very, obviously, prestigious organization. So these books, the clinicians rely on these as guides to their best practices. And so there's a detailed treatment of nutrition therapy, pharmacological treatments, a little bit of a mention of stress, and the impact of stress, and the need to keep it down, things like anxiety, depression. But, but almost nothing mentioned about this S factor, even though this S factor, as I will know very shortly, can have a dramatic impact on health, including diabetes. So it's quite amazing. Cardiovascular disease, okay. the leading cause of death in North America. Uh, in 2002, almost 700,000 people died from cardiovascular disease, various forms of cardiovascular disease, which is pretty darn close to a third of all deaths. Um, in 2006, it was projected to cause um, uh, cost more than $250 billion. It was a huge problem. So what are the chief risk factors? The usual suspects. Hypertension, high blood cholesterol, diabetes, obesity, smoking, sedentary lifestyle, but the S factor was missing. It wasn't there. Even though these other factors are very important, but the S factor, um, again, as I will mention very shortly, can have just as much of an effect on your, on your risk of contracting uh, heart disease as any of these other factors. Why is it missing? Well, that's another issue. Uh, I went to a bookstore recently, went to the health section a bookstore looking for book. I, I wanted to learn a little bit more about what kinds of information uh, is available for the general public. If the, if the general public wanted to learn about things that they could do to keep themselves healthy, they would talk to a bookstore, you know, whatever. 
uh, go on to an online bookstore. Well, I found tons of books on, this is just a sample, I found tons of books on diet, like tons of books on diet. I found uh, books on uh, exercise, fitness, uh, there's some books on stress control. Almost nothing in the health section was on this S factor. I had to go to the psychology section. And, and even then, um, there was no link between this S factor and health. There was no link between this, this particular factor, this variable, and its impact on health. So um, the S factor, I, are, I would like to argue, is just as powerful as any of these other factors, um, if not more so, but has remained um, uh, you know, largely uh, unrecognized for what it is. So what is this S factor? Well, it is social relationships, which I guess is not a big surprise given that this is a relationships class. Um, but there it is. Your social relationships can have a profound and widespread impact on your health, more so than probably, as I say, the most really appreciated. And the first piece of evidence that I'd like to to present to you uh, regarding um, the impact of uh, social relationships on health is some evidence that social isolation is a killer. It will kill you if you're socially isolated. Okay. Um, in the late 80s, House Landis and Emerson published a very, <clears throat> very good comprehensive review of the literature um, looking at the effects of the degree to which people were integrated in their communities and the risk of mortality within a, a given time period. And there were a number of studies that were done looking at this in different uh, countries. Um, uh, and the, so what they did, these were long-term perspective studies. So what they did was they, um, they, they took members of the, of the various communities and uh, at time one, and then they asked them, they, they, they obtained an index of their social connectedness or social embeddedness. And that index typically um, included, there, there, were, there were some variations across studies, but they typically included things like whether they were married or not, whether how many families and friends they had, um, uh, whether they were involved in church or synagogue activities, uh, how many formal and formal groups, uh, memberships they had. So this was a, a kind of an index of how socially embedded they were. And then, at some period in the future, five years, ten years in the future, they looked at how many of these people had died. Uh, so they looked at the survival rate in this particular, in, in this particular set of study. So what did they find? What did they find? Well, they found that those who were the most isolated had two to four times the risk of dying in the given time period that they, that they looked at, that, then though, uh, compared to the people who were most integrated. And what I think is particularly most interesting is the age-adjusted risk, risk ratios are stronger than the relative risk for, for all-cause mortality due to cigarette smoking. In other words, it's more risky to be socially isolated than it is to smoke. If you have to choose one, better to smoke. <laughs> not, that I'm, not that I'm advising that. But just to give you the, the kind of risk that we're talking about. And given this, it's, uh, you might, uh, you know, you'll see it. Uh, this is just a little piece of the evidence. Really, to present all of the evidence would take a whole day lecture, not just a 45 minutes. There's, 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 there's a lot. <clears throat> so why? Why is there this effect? 